The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. I'm going to talk about specific concrete housing example on the coast once I get to that point in my presentation. The Concrete Foundations Association had within it a group that we called the Concrete Homes Council. It was people who were taking standard residential forms and adapting them to use for building concrete homes. They were ideal for the coastal homes and that's what I'm going to show you is one of the a series of homes that were built down in South Carolina. Who wouldn't want to wake up to a photo like this every morning. I visited, we had a, an event at Amelia Island in Florida and I had a balcony room and this is basically what I was waking up to every day and I can see why people want to move to the coast. Well, this isn't my idea of a relaxing time on the coast, but again, recreation is another reason that people love to live near the coast. So in order to get closer to that, we see more and more people building homes in harm's way, basically, in the coast. And the last statistics I got, and this is within 10 meters or 30 feet of sea level or within 120 miles of the coast, 39% of the United States population, that's 123 million people, live this close to the ocean. Uh, worldwide, it's actually even a little greater than that, about 40 plus percent, or over 3 billion people live close to the ocean. Now, when that happens, when people are living there, obviously Mother Nature tries to correct things periodically. She's trying to say, I don't want that many of you living that close. A tsunami in 2004, I mean, that's the first tsunami I can actually remember in my lifetime. And it was, I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, I'm still mesmerized when you watch the photographs of that event happening. And another one is the tsunami in Japan in 11. There's a YouTube video you can get where you can actually see the entire, it's about a 15 minute video and you see the entire event unfold and how people just, first I think they're mesmerized before it and then it turns to terror as people realize, you know, that water's going to continue to rise. But anyway, Mother Nature makes attempts to get, bring things back to normal. Something that's probably more familiar to us here in the United States are at least these two recent storms that we've had, relatively recent, uh, Hurricane Katrina, which hit New Orleans and, and the Gulf Coast, and of course Sandy, which was uh, probably not as strong of a storm, but yet it hit a much more populated area, so the damage was much greater because of Sandy. And when that happens, again, you see Mother Nature trying to take back that area that the people wanted to live in. It's just part of the process. Again, here's an area in the New York coast that got hit by the Sandy area, the, the storm surges, the rise in the tides and everything uh, made a difference. And I'm not going to talk about global warming here or climate change, that's not my thing, but you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that something's going on. This is the CO2 in the atmosphere at the uh, Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, which is above, you know, it's so far removed that they figure that's a good representation of what's happening with CO2. And you see this curve here, and but the thing is, it starts in 1960, the, we saw CO2 levels starting to rise really with the start of the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. But keep in mind that this was a relatively constant for hundreds of thousands of years, we had a very small change in the CO2 in the atmosphere. And then we saw this curve coming in, I think, in February of this, this year, we reached 400 parts per million, the highest it's ever been recorded in terms of recent, certainly history. And with that, of course, come global temperatures. And the only reason I mention this is that you saw that statistic that I said about how many people live within 30 feet of ocean level. I mean, put this into perspective. It's not going to happen in our lifetime. It may never happen. But you take just the ice that's sequestered in the Greenland ice cap, if all of that were to, to melt, that would raise the oceans about 23 feet. Uh, that means a lot of those people that live close to the ocean would be in trouble. Hopefully things will happen that this won't be a, an issue, but I know the protesters are lining up everywhere to resist climate change. My closing remark on that is just that what if all this is a hoax and all we get out of it is a better environment and a nicer place to live? 
Anyway, challenges that we face, of course, tidal waves you can't do too much about, but climate change is another thing that's going to happen. You know, there's forces set in motion there that we can't do much about. But what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this is something that we can do something about, and that's prepare to build our structures to take wind damage and storm surge, which are the main things that these storms hit. This is the area that, according to some of the maps, shows that are most at risk when it comes to our hurricanes and Atlantic storms, but this is where most of those people live within close proximity of the coast. Uh, this house has to be the poster child for concrete housing. This is the house in Pass Christian, Mississippi, and again, you can see the one house that's built on piers. The rest of them were literally scoured clean. I went in there with Steve Scalco and I and some other people were doing some seminars down in the coastal region. So we drove out uh, to look at the damage and found this house. The storm surge went up halfway about up to the middle of the lower floor windows there. The ironic thing about this house is the guy moved what he could up to the third floor. Then he took his rest of his possessions and moved them three miles inland. Those were all destroyed. <laughs> Uh, the stuff that was on the third floor here made it through. I'm going to show how a house like this is constructed and the benefits of it. And I'll reiterate what Brent said is that this isn't the only system that will work. There are plenty of good systems out there. Uh, mainly they're built out of concrete, although you can do some out of wood. But I'm going to talk about the one I have the most knowledge with, and that's the removable form cast in place systems. You have to start, of course, with design. And it was mentioned earlier that you need to make sure that you not just build above the anticipated wave height, but you need to have some clear freeboarding area underneath the structure. So you have to start by building the houses up. What was ironic is when we were back looking at that house in Pastor Christian, they were starting to rebuild. And the sad thing was is they were rebuilding it just the way it was before it was knocked down. And yet our tax dollars are probably helping pay for that. Yeah, it worked for 150 years, but uh, it's not wise. All right, when you're building on the coast, you need to start off with a good foundation. Chances are you don't have rock unless you're building up uh, in Maine or somewhere like that. You're probably building in an area where you have sand that goes down to a considerable depth. So most of these houses, these were there's a series of three houses that were built in Topsail Island in South Carolina, but they started with a pier system that was sunk down into the sand. It was an auger system that concrete replaced the sand as, as it went into the ground and provided friction bearing for the foundation above. After that, they were tied together with a series of grade beams so that if you, as you have sand erosion, and these piers went down anywhere from 35 to 45 feet. You know, you can't go down to six or eight feet, even if you had the bearing or the friction going down six to eight or 10 feet. You know, if you get a bad storm event, you could have several feet of soil erosion, so it, it wouldn't be good. After that, they started, and this shows them actually pouring the grade beams. Uh, these are heavily reinforced structures, but then we went with the piers, and again, the height of those piers is determined by whatever the wave height is and some freeboarding space above that. After that's done, then we put a deck on top of that, and this is where, again, a lot of the houses that we saw, they had the piers on them, but what they were doing is putting a wood deck on top of the piers. So you didn't have a lot unless the piers were strong enough to stand by themselves or cantilevered up, and the deck came along, everything went with it. But what we're seeing in these houses that were done in the Carolina coast were actually a concrete deck. Now, you could have put a wood house on top of that, and it would be been better than putting a wood house on a deck. But in this case, we went on up with concrete walls. But this is all tied together. It gives that base for the house a very strong base to work from. And these are done using traditional aluminum forming systems. There were some adaptations made to use these same aluminum forms that they used since the 40s anyway on their hall on the walls of the house. Now they're using them for walls as well as the decks themselves. This is one of, like Brent, these are all four inch thick walls, I believe. The thin four inch walls are adequate for the loads that we're talking about. And then they cap that off with another deck. And in most cases, these houses went up even one more level. But this shows the deck being done. These are the standard panels that they would use for the walls, but they would introduce a shoring system so that it would fit their module. I have temporary bracing in there. And you can see the walls and the deck all being formed. I think at least all the three major aluminum four manufacturers, which would be Western and Wall Ties and uh, Precise, they all have adaptations to their system that allow them to be used in this type of construction. And if you're not familiar with them, typically they're two foot or three foot wide modular panels, uh, but they have so many different little fillers and things that you have a lot of versatility in terms of what and how you would build with these systems. 
This one actually shows the reinforcement on the inside. There's two different ways you can do it. I think the next one maybe shows that. Yeah, on the left here, you see a concrete, insulated concrete sandwich wall. This one has concrete on both sides of the insulation. The insulation can go from anywhere from two inches to four inches or six inches. Uh, this one uses a non-conductive composite fiber tie to tie the two layers of concrete together. Uh, the one on the right is the one that was used on the top sail island houses. In this case, they positioned the insulation against the outside of the form. You could have put it on the inside if you wanted to also, but on the outside, that means you've isolated the thermal mass inside and provides a little greater benefit in terms of the conditioning of the space. But this is a typical setup. And you see, in this case, they have what they call a breakback tie. In other words, if that tie extended through the insulation, you would actually have a thermal bridge to that insulation and wouldn't perform as well from an energy perspective. But those ties break back to the back side of the insulation. And this system also has a plastic flange there, which is suitable to a tie. You know, if you want to put siding on it, you've got something you can screw burring strips and put siding onto it. Although most of these, the most successful ones I've seen are usually done with you know, a stucco system. So this is the wall before the outside set of forms are put on. And then I just finished my house and I wanted to do cast in place sandwich wall basement and then tilt wall on the upper floor. But it is still difficult working with, I mean, I, here I have associations that work with contractors, but you know, it, it's hard to get them out of their comfort zone, especially if they're not used to doing this thing. So here you've got a situation where you've got uh, if you want electric conduit placed in the wall, you know, that's something they're not used to doing, or at least a lot of them in our area aren't used to doing that. And every time I turned around, it was something that they weren't used to doing. And rather than absorb the cost of the learning curve, they wanted to get paid for the learning curve. So I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do. I always said when I built my house, it was the classic case of an architect who had a client who couldn't afford what he wanted. As I said, there's quite a bit of versatility in the forms, angles. Uh, I've even seen some, you know, in our, we have a contest we call the Basement from Hell Award, and we see some unbelievable foundations being built with these standard modular systems. So they've made a lot of adaptations to them. This is one ready to pour, and Brent mentioned this, but uh, the wall tie form people created this really nice little cove. It actually, it would certainly probably facilitates the placement of the concrete easier because you don't have that angle there. But then when you get on the inside, you've got a, a natural cove molding that's all the way around your house on the inside. So it's a, it was a nice little addition. Pouring these, these are done typically with a monolithic pour. The walls and the decks are poured all at the same time. It's an ideal way to do it. I know this one isn't using self-consolidating concrete, but I know we did a, a sample of the world of concrete, I don't know, probably 10 years ago. And they used a special mix. It was self-consolidating concrete, and they hooked pipes on at the bottom and they pumped it from the bottom up and it cured I think in 24 hours it was up to strength. Anyway, typically they're done with all the walls, interior and exterior and the deck all in one operation. It is difficult when you're dealing with a four inch thick wall and if you're using standard number four reinforcement uh, you are creating quite a few restrictions there so you're using typically a, a mix with smaller aggregate in it. The ideal scenario of course is to go to the welded wire fabric. Uh, because you can get all the steel you need there and it allows the concrete to flow much better. Most of the houses that I've seen done with our members with this type of scenario, usually they would do a, a concrete lid and then they basically put a wood frame roof on top of that, sort of a sacrificial roof. If it, the wind gets bad enough, you're going to lose the roof, but you still got a solid concrete deck underneath that, so the amount of damage to the interior of the house will be minimal. But I have seen some of the people, they, they do make systems now where you can use standard forms and you can actually pour a sloping roof on them. You have to obviously adjust the slump of the concrete and do a few other things. But uh, it's possible to have a totally concrete house. Uh, it could look just like, you probably could have concrete furniture. Do you remember that commercial, one of the Terminex commercials where the people were walking into the house? <laughs> I always like to give that, but that isn't what our houses look like on the inside. This is what it typically looks like when you strip the forms off. I think Brent had a slide similar to that. If you're using a good concrete mix, you can get an amazingly smooth, surface with minimum bug holes and that surface is very easily covered with somebody with reasonably good plastering skills and you, like I said you can't tell the difference between that wall and a typical plaster drywall unless you go up and try to punch it and of course homeowners you know you never know what their questions are going to be and I know Kurt Fields was saying I can't the, the ladies were so concerned about hanging pictures that she didn't want to buy this concrete home and 
So I know what he did in their closing was he would bring as a gift to them a hammer drill <laughs> so that at every closing they had a hammer drill. There's other ways of getting around that. You could embed a reverse bevel wood strip around there so you could have a hanging strip. But you know, there's, there are solutions to every hurdle that somebody throws at you. It's just a matter of you've got to be creative and you've got to think outside the box, so to speak. Another view, again, the same one that Brent had shown about what the interior looks like before the plastering or the coating and afterwards. So this is the finished homes. There were a series of three of them built along the Carolinas coast. I know they were excited because, like, within a year or so after they built those, there was, I don't know what the name of the hurricane one, but it was coming up the coast. And they were probably the only people wishing that the hurricane would come inland just a little bit further so they could actually test these houses three years or so after they did it. They're built up high enough. They've got, as is typical when you have a barrier island, you gotta, you can't walk through all that brush. You've got to be able to get over it, so that was incorporated in with the houses. But, and we have the materials. We have the systems to do it. But there are still some hurdles relative to the fully utilizing concrete homes. We were actually getting a really good start until the recession came. And now, you know, it's like we've got to start over again and probably even from a few steps back. But codes and regulations are still behind. They're getting caught up. We can get, I think, 332 is, you know, our goal is to get an above grade residential uh, design criteria into the code once we can get that far. But the bigger hold are probably the insurance companies and the banks. Insurance companies don't seem to be willing to give us the credit. I mean, appraisers are terrible. I mean, if they can't find a comparable, then, you know, you get very little, if any, benefit from what you've done. And I don't know how we address that. I mean, that's certainly something we need to do. Builders and designers, of course, designers are coming around and, and fortunately most builders can deliver almost anything that we can design, you know, they can deliver it, but they have to think outside the box. You have to be willing to absorb a little learning curve to get that done. And of course, owner misconceptions. Most people think concrete, they think basement. And even the basements today aren't what the basements of old were. You can make them very livable, very comfortable, but uh, a lot of owners still have misconceptions about what a concrete house is and what it can do. So that's my presentation on above-grade homes.